Um, my presentation, I'm going to talk about what is dystonia, the general term. What are the facial dystonias, like buffer spasm, hemifacial spasm, oral mandibular dystonia, MEJ syndrome, and spasmodic dysphonia. I'm also going to touch a little bit about how we measure the severity of these disorders. I'm going to only skim the top of what might cause facial disorders because my other panel members will go over that in more detail. And also what can be done about facial dystonia, I'll also just skim that because Drs. Callaghan, Rao, and Obrey are going to go over that too. Okay, what is dystonia? The word means a syndrome of sustained muscle contractions frequently causing a twisting or repetitive movements or abnormal postures. Dystonia can occur in any part of the body and this picture is someone who might have general dystonia. Dystonia disturbs the way the brain processes movement. It causes extra movements or extra force, like a muscle spasm or a contraction. And dystonia is often hard to explain to even other physicians. One way I think about it is sort of an unbraked or an unmodulated brain. So to give you some more detail about that. So the basal ganglia, or the deep part of the brain, have to modulate or process all of the actions that the cortex, or you can sort of think of that as the conscious brain, want to make. So to give you an example in our arms, which is the easiest one to understand, if your conscious brain or the cortex wants to reach out and grab that cup of coffee in front of you, that's all you really have to think about. It's the basal ganglia that have to do all the processing of how fast are we going to reach for it, how smooth is that movement going to be. And then once we get to the cup, how hard are we going to grab it and how uh, strength-wise are we going to use to lift it. We don't have to think about all that stuff. We just reach out, grab the coffee cup, and put it in our mouth. And we've all experienced it when the basal ganglia got it wrong. When you thought that cup was full, and you reached out and picked it up and went like that. Yeah, it got it wrong, but it did all of that processing to get that movement down to what it thought was going to be the right exact movement. And dystonia, well, we'll keep moving. It was a video of blood first spasm, which I actually did think was kind of silly to put in this, uh, <laughs> in this presentation. I mean, just, you know, look at your neighbor in the mirror. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, as all of you know, it is blood first spasm is uncontrollable squinting or eye closing. So in this case, the thought is maybe the basal ganglia aren't processing the information just to blink or close your eyes. It's doing some other extra movements that don't need to happen. Women are more affected than men. And over 60 is more common than under 60. And light sensitivity seems to be a pretty ubiquitous function or a symptom of blood flow spasm. Blink right with. Okay, right? Recognize it? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> All right, this is hemifacial spasm, which is uncontrollable contraction of one side of the face. Um, as opposed to some of the other dystonias we'll talk about, we do know that this one can be due to damage to the nerve of the face. Oromandibular lingual dystonia. This is oromandibular dystonia, 
or uncontrollable jaw moving, uh, opening, closing. Can also include deviations of the tongue or the mouth. And if you combine the two, blepharospasm and oromandibular dystonia, you get something called Mege syndrome. Dr. Mege didn't have this, so there's some controversy over calling it that, but it's about 1 in 20,000 people. Women, again, more unlucky than men. And sometimes there can be some cervical dystonia along with it. So her head pulling forward is part of that dystonia. I read an article from the 1800s um, about this, and they first thought that all that grimacing in the mouth was just to open the eyes. But we learned, I guess, later on that that's, those are all abnormal movements, too. Okay, now this one, I am going to totally cheat and let it play. This is just um, spasmodic dysphonia. And the only way to describe it is to hear it. I got this video off of YouTube looking for good videos of that vocal quality. And the introduction happens to be everything I would have said. So I'm going to play it. It's just about a minute and a half long. Hopefully you can hear the audio from the video. Yet it affects over 50,000 people in North America, and probably many more that are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Spasmodic dysphonia is a dystonia, or involuntary movement disorder of the larynx, where the muscles involved in speech are activated in ways that lead to a strained or strangled or sometimes a breathy voice quality during voicing, whereas the muscles are, uh, behave normally during breathing and swallowing and at rest, so it's actually induced by speaking. Manifesting in different forms, spasmodic dysphonia can sound different from person to person. It's the AD form of spasmodic dysphonia plus a tremor component with it. I have the rare aversion, the AB or the abductor version, my vocal cords uh, stay open rather than open and shut, and I sound breathy. I have a B and a D, and I also have tremor. So measuring severity um, from one doctor to another, and generally we need to have some kind of objective scales. And there are several scales, the Burke Fawn Marsden rating scale, unified dystonia rating scale, a global dystonia rating scale with just a subset, subset of the UDRS, and Jankovic rating scale. All of these have their advantages and disadvantages. And they are used mostly in research because on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think my panel would probably agree, the most important measure of severity is the patient's opinion of his or her dystonia, dystonia um, which is um, the POHD scale. <laughs> um, what I mean by that, and uh, I assume hopefully everybody understands that, is that what one physician might think as more severe patient compared to another patient uh, might not truly be that in the eyes of the actual beholder. So it's not uncommon that a patient who I might think is mild says, ah, I got to do absolutely everything you can possibly do for my eyes uh, because it's life ending or life changing or I can't live with it. So the severity is really based on what the patient's opinion of it is. OK, 
Okay, so what causes facial dystonias? If anybody has the answer, can you please stand up? <laughs> Shoot. Thought we could just go ahead and end it and go to the quarter and call it a day. Um, so there have been um, publications of people who've had these facial dystonias due to basal ganglia strokes or strokes in the deep brain, tumors in the deep brain. Um, nerve injury, like I said, is fairly common for the hemifacial spasm. We also know that certain medications can cause dystonias. Uh, most infamously are the antipsychotics that can most commonly cause the oromandibular dystonia. There are some genetic factors genetic predispositions to dystonia, but the biggest cause for facial dystonias, for most people, I should say, is unknown. What can be done about the facial dystonias? So I believe um, Dr. Rao is going to talk more about oral medications, um, and Dr. Galligan Calligan later will talk about botulinum toxins. And Dr. Oberg is going to talk about the surgery. So I'm not going to touch on those. But I just want us all to appreciate for a moment the time that we live in, both from the physician side and the patient side. This is an article from 1857, trying inhaled chloroform <laughs> for, uh, to treat blepharospasm. Not sure that would pass through our IRB right now. <laughs> so, the end. Thank you, and let's.